Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast, where we dive into how emerging technologies will impact the world and your bank account. I'm Trent Fowler, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, Thomas Fry. Thomas and I are futurists, keynote speakers, and consultants with decades of experience in analyzing emerging trends and communicating new developments to audiences across the world. Reach out to us at futuratipodcast.com slash contact dash futurati if you'd like to hire us for consulting, to speak at your event, or to advertise on our podcast. Thomas, we just wrapped up an excellent interview with famed podcaster Dorkish Patel. What did you think of it? Yeah, well, clearly he's deeply steeped in in everything AI um, and the kind of all of the issues that they're contending with right now to try to move AI to the next level. Um, there, there seems to be this counterforce that's pushing against it now trying to throw uh, poison pills and things into the AI system to try to uh, disrupt it. And I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that in the future. Uh, so it's it's interesting listening to his take on how these things can be resolved. So I think he's uh, uh, just a fascinating young man that uh, has been uh, interviewing s- clearly some of the top researchers in this field. Yeah, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, you're right. He, he's interviewed like almost all of them, like Shane Legg and Elias Yudkowsky and all of these top names that you read about and pick their brains and come out of it with a, a really interesting uh, thesis on the whole thing. So we, we talked about the scaling hypothesis, the reasons for and against believing that bigger LLM or deep learning systems will be able to be agentic or to operate uh, in, in a very general fashion. And many other things besides, and it was it was a fascinating and illuminating conversation. And he also has just an amazing job, right? So he's he's been successful enough with podcasting that he's able to do it full time now. And his whole his his whole day, every everything he's oriented towards is just learning new stuff, and then using that to ask questions of the smartest people in the world. And I can't think of a better job than that. It's basically what we're trying to do here. Well, sitting around reading textbooks, that's not my uh, my thinking of what a fun day is, but. Uh, it is for me. <laughs> <laughs> Some people would enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I certainly would. Uh, and speaking of enjoying it, we hope you enjoy this episode with Dorkish Patel. Tonight, we're joined by Dorkish Patel. Dorkesh is a renowned podcaster who has hosted interviews with luminaries like Mark Andreessen, Eliezer Yudkowsky, and Grant Sanderson. He's best known for the extent of the effort he puts into researching the topics he speaks with his guests about and for covering an exceptionally wide intellectual ground. If you enjoy this interview, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. Dorcas, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Let's hear a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to working on the problems that you're working on today. Uh, to what extent does podcasting a problem? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I was a uh, sophomore in college. COVID hit. I was studying computer science. And so classes went online. I was pretty bored. I started uh, the podcast. I just emailed a few people in the beginning. Brian Gaplin was a, a very kind to be my first guest. And then, um, you know, Tyler Cowan came on pretty soon after. Anyways, just kind of got the ball rolling. Um, and so that was just kind of a side thing for a couple of years while I was getting my degree. Afterwards, I graduated. I thought, uh, you know, let's give it a try for a couple more months. Get, give it a gap year kind of thing. Uh, okay, podcasts are growing. Uh, at some point, I realized, uh, I guess this is my full-time thing now. Well, that's very interesting. Um, how to, Do you have any advice to fellow podcasters about how to grow a podcast? I mean, I, I know I noticed yours has taken on pretty quickly. The the George Hotz and Elias Yudkowsky debate was a brilliant marketing move. Um, but <laughs> you, you, seem, you seem to also have like success earlier on than that. So I, I, I didn't know if if there was anything in particular you found that helped uh, boost view counts or or what? Um, I think that uh, like, uh, you're, you're just like not going to be able to compete on the, the, like the traditional things. Uh, we, um, just you think like a default interview podcast and it's like, come on, talk about the intro chapter to your book. Um, 
And if it's if, if if the interview sounds like any other they do on any other podcast, if somebody's out there shilling a book, I, yeah, you're just not gonna be able to compete there because there's millions of podcasts. So it's, there has to be something where uh, it's it is a memorable if you do an interview of somebody, uh, something you're bringing to the table. Um, and I guess that because it has to be particular, it's like hard to maybe say in generic terms. Uh, but yeah, for me, it's been sort of like doing a lot of prep, but. It's in some sense, I, I don't know, that sounds weird to say as a distinguishing thing, because other people also do prep, but so, I don't know, something along those lines. Yeah, so talk, talk to us a little bit about the prep. So, like, one thing you're well known for is the exhaustive prep you do for each of these interviews. Uh, do, do you look for particular angles or insights in these people's work? They're often very prolific, they've written a lot of stuff, but they also go on a lot of podcasts. So how do you suss through everything they've produced in order to find things that uh, that, that might make your show stand out? Yeah. Part of it is I I just pick people whose work I want to just consume and devour. So it really, I'm thinking to myself um, when I invite somebody on the podcast, or if I'm thinking of considering uh, inviting somebody on the podcast, is this somebody who I want to spend two weeks just reading everything they've ever written? Not only that, but then reading things they're citing, reading people commenting on their stuff, reading relevant things in the field. And if the answer is no, I don't interview them. But if I do decide to interview them, then it's like really exhausted. We, um, you know, talk to other people in the field. You know, when I do, a, for example, an AI person, I'll like talk, talk to like half a dozen or a dozen AI researchers in advance, like try to get a, feel, a hand, handle on the field and like, you know, um, uh, all the papers or something. If I'm interviewing an economist, I just interviewed Tyler, you know, just like literally reading through all the all the actual books he's citing. He had a new book about economic history. So just like reading through Keynes, Hayek, um mill uh uh yeah i mean i, I don't know just like again actually just doing the work so let's what, do you think, what do you think podcasting will look like uh 20 years from now yeah i don't know what anything will look like 20 years from now <laughs> especially given my views on uh, the, the 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 topic of ai yeah so um, how does it how does this whole industry evolve i i think i think this might be interesting in that yeah, I think this might be one of the most, um, I don't know if stable is the right word, but if there's wide scale automation, uh, you know, one of my friends had a funny, uh, uh, made a funny comment that we're all doing things that may or may not exist in the future, but Dorkesh, you are the only one who has like a retirement proof job of like, even if the automation happens, you know, like, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Let, let's think about this actually. What would change about podcasting in the future? Hopefully it'll be a lot easier. I think there's a lot of startup cost of, I mean, obviously it's pretty trivial to like do the recording itself, but to do it well, cinematography, making clips, doing the copy editing, things like that. So hopefully it's it's much more, you shoot it and you can just kind of forget about it and everything else is taken care of. Well, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, we could deep fake you. They'd be like a, a Dorkish yeah. fake, right? So, you, so we could automate the, the Dorkish show. It would just be, you know, bots talking to each other or something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, spe uh, speaking about artificial intelligence, let let's go ahead and get into that. So a lot of the recent episodes you've done have concerned this. So uh, I, I thought we would begin with just a really broad overview question of how you think about AI safety. Yeah, honestly, even in the last few weeks, my, I, I'm like really trying to think through what I think about this. Uh, and I, uh, I mean, the, the, the sort of meta thing is, Obviously, it's very hard to predict. And in if you look at the past, it's just like very people have been actually pretty able to predict specific things about how AI has progressed. Who saw, um, I mean, I, I, there are a few people, maybe like Ilya and Dario saw scaling happening, being the dominant factor. But very few people saw scaling as a dominant factor even before like 2020. Uh, just LLMs as the method of this unsupervised learning as a method to getting to current levels of uh, AI where people saw that coming. So yeah, uh, fundamentally understanding is like unpredictable, but also the, the, the basic argument that these things will be very smart, uh, potentially smarter than us. It's worth thinking through that they don't just have random drives and uh, that the world after, I mean, having some sense of like, oh, it's not probably going to involve space in some ways. So we should think through that part of it as well. I'll be reading into the specifics here, but like, uh, um, yeah, th th there's a lot of uncertainty here. Well, yeah, let's let's get into the specifics and uh, the specifics specifically around the scaling hypothesis. I know you recently wrote an essay about this. I agree that most of us were blindsided by how much you could get out of scaling. I think it's still very much an open question as to whether or not that can take you all the way to general intelligence. So 
how do you, how do you think about those things? Well, what's your research led you to believe? Yeah. In the post I said, I think there's a 70% chance that something that kind of looks like the current approach, but much bigger will probably work uh, by, I don't know, that next 10, 20 years. And so you can approach it from multiple angles. Um, you can first think through like, why would we expect scaling to work? And then there's all these sorts of, uh, uh, you know, is it, is it just like uh, uh, neural networks or just learning these Turing machines that are relevant to different domains and it just universally approximates the right functions. But then you can ask questions of what do these actual curves imply about when we hit AGI? So even if uh, theoretically it's possible to get there, and then you look at the actual uh, pace of progress, uh, look at whether there's any bottlenecks. Is there going to be a data bottleneck? Is there going to be a compute bottleneck? And it does look like the main hurdle will be the data bottleneck, which it seems is already upon us. I think we'll learn a lot this year about the scaling hypothesis, uh, whether the, if GPT-5 is much better than GPT-4 or notably better, and if we did run into the data bottleneck already, um, but if I think this year and next year, we're going to learn a ton. If the models keep getting better, I think like, you know, but it's, it's probably, it, we're, we're, we're probably in for it. Uh, if not, then I guess we got more time or some, some other approach might, uh, come in. Where, where does that 70% figure come from? How do you tabulate something like that? Uh, I, you know, I mean, honestly, it's just like, uh, I, I like the betting odds interpretation of probability, which is that if I had to make a bet with somebody, I, these are the odds I think would be fair. Um, but it's not, uh, I, I can't like draw the Bayesian free or anything. Um, it's just like a number I would feel fair betting on. Very interesting. So, so there's, <clears throat> there's a lot of people that are trying to cloak their data, um, uh, disguise it, to uh, uh, make it so that, uh, open AI can't go in and steal their, their information, their data. Um, and there's, uh, there's actually a lot of, uh, poison pill activity going on along with that. Does, does this have the potential to cause, um, like an open AI system to totally erupt with, uh, too much corrupt data in it? That's an interesting question. The anthropic sleep anthropic sleeper agents paper that was released a few weeks ago suggests that something like this may be a possibility. On the other hand, you would have hoped that as models get smarter, one of the things they would be able to do is generalize. And one of the generalizations they should hopefully be able to make is that even in the domains with uh, poison data, that the basic way they've been taught to operate should apply as well. So. Yeah, I guess it'll be sort of an empirical question of um, uh, what I so it, you can think about it two ways. Maybe if like if they manage to generalize, then this problem is solved. And if they don't manage to generalize, then these models are screwed anyways, right? So uh, yeah, I, I think this, this particular problem hopefully will go away unless the engineers are uh, specifically trying to engineer it in to make it robust against uh, the the normal s scheme of uh, post training they do. Um, like no, no matter what, make sure like we have the root uh, pseudo access to our uh, model if you like type in the right key phrase. Hello, this is Trent Fowler, co-host of the Futurati podcast. One of the most common pieces of marketing advice I've come across is to know your audience and give them what they want. One difficulty in podcasting is that it's actually pretty hard to do this. None of the major platforms give us any way to reach out to you, our listeners, to find out what you enjoy about the Futurati podcast and what you'd like to see done differently. So we've decided to record this commercial and ask you directly to reach out to us. Head over to futuratipodcast.com, go to the contact page, and drop us a line. Tell us about your favorite and least favorite episodes, what you'd like to see us cover in the future, and anything else you want us to know. We produce this show for you, and we want your advice so we can make it even better. Thank you. What is the most compelling argument for scaling working? I mean, obviously, GPT-3 has it blew us all away with how good it was, but uh, to, to extrapolate from that to say, and it will be good at everything, even though it's not an agent operating in the world, seems like a, a point you'd want to pin down pretty carefully. So yeah, yeah. so walk walk me through that just evidence. Yeah, so what the, the big piece of evidence is just like, it's kept working. Like these models have uh, 
whether you're looking at benchmarks or whether you're looking at just evaluating their performance, G each uh, version of GPT is 100x more compute than the one before, roughly, uh, or at least effective compute. And you go from like GPT-1 to GPT-2, obviously a big jump. It's like the GPT-1 is like so stupid. Uh, GPT-2 is like, I don't know, can do bigram level stuff, can basically word association, but nothing beyond that. GPT-3, it's like, oh my, I don't know, it's like interesting now. Uh, GPT-3.5, oh, I actually like do some economically valuable tasks. GPT-4, as you, you know, chat GPT, it probably does billions of revenue. So it just like, it worked for many orders of magnitude. Um, if it works for another uh, um, eight orders of magnitude or whatever it is that goes from four to eight, that seems like a, a compelling, the current trend seems compelling. As for the point about agent AIs, the idea there is just that to do a task, uh, um, uh, to do, like if we're training these models to do a task over a long a horizon to like maybe engage with the job over the course of a day, that requires it to act as an agent. And so that agentic ability is just something we're, we're training into these models. The agentic ability is something we're training into these models. But I mean, in, in what way, though? I mean, they're, they're trying to predict how text will end. I, I don't know that any of them are being trained specifically to work on jobs. It turns out that some of them kind of can with things like baby AGI or super AGI, some of these systems mm -hmm. that are trying to bolt agency onto it. But I don't, I don't think the models themselves are being trained to be agents in any real way. I, I'm not aware of any major ongoing efforts to build robust agents. I mean, robotics maybe, but. Oh yeah, no, you're, no, good point. Like that, the next algorithm prediction itself is a, a totally uh, short horizon task. And that, that doesn't, uh, uh, that doesn't train for agency. Uh, th there's two points. One is I, I actually think like they're literally training them to be agentic because that's like, that's an economically valuable thing to train them to do. So if you think of, for example, a, um, just like doing a thousand uh, line pull requests or something. I'm sure the labs are training the models to be able to do that uh, or being able to engage with the code base or something. Um, and more generally, I, to the extent that predicting sequences over long periods of time um, requires uh, an ability to engage with long horizon goals, but this, is, this is something you might just expect to come along for the ride. I do think it's like an open question of how soon it happens, but... Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if GPT-5 has some adjusting abilities. Where like the, uh, the auto GPT setups that we have so far would work with GPT-5. How do you assess something like that? Because this is a question that I keep running into. It's like, how would you know agency is in there? Like, even if it's able to predict the next token so well that it could, you know, execute 10 steps in a process, it, it seems like with an agent, especially something like an artificial general intelligence, such as a human being, it's like you're talking about a vastly richer set of goals and set of capabilities and internal motivations like that still seems like it's kind of far away even if we can sort of you know prompt it in the right way such that it, it kind of behaves like an agent or talks like one it still seems like you're sort of a long way away from that I'm, I'm not unsympathetic to the idea that if you train if you grind hard enough on the optimization process you get an agent out of it that's Yudkowsky's ba basic thesis right and that's what happened the first time when we got human beings from natural selection but uh, it, it just, it seems to me like, well, I don't want to say hand waving, but there's a lot being read into that. And I, I am sympathetic to it, but not, I guess, totally convinced. I, I guess it depends on, so it, it can be an agent being, meaning being able to engage as an agent in a particular job you give it, or it could mean agent and like a misaligned agent. And I, I feel like those are two separate things. On, on the first point of like just being an agent to building, is that the thing you're referring to? Is that are, are you like? Well, we can talk. We can talk about both. The the, the okay. latter is the one you'd be scared of. But yeah, right. both. both are, that, are you skeptical of the first one as well? I'm much less skeptical of that. I mean, uh, Auto GPT right. can kind of do stuff like that, and yeah, it's not hard for me to imagine that GPT five or six might be able to to underwrite those more expanded capacities. Yeah, I, I think it's not that. Well, unreasonable to think that the again, this is something I'm like, oh, I, I could be wrong about this, but I, I would be surprised if the second a misaligned, maybe like a loaded word, but just in the sense of you need some sort of heuristics to think about what, what how how to get to your goals and uh, what what the goals worth pursuing are. Just the way that evolution gave us certain drives to get to goals, uh, and that 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 might get messed up. But I, I mean, yeah, actually, I want to back up and like make sure we're talking about the same thing. So like. But you don't doubt that they'll be able to engage as agents in a job um, if given like even the next token prediction thing of if you have to replicate how a human would think across a sequence of text, 
if that human has to is writing as an agent, for example, or doing the job as an agent, then presumably the ability to become an agent is like part part of doing that prediction well. Well, they they already can kind of do stuff like that, but but right. it, you know what you would want, I think, if if you were going to have an agent that was majorly economically destabilizing or was the sort of thing we might worry about in some way, it would it would have to have. I guess, longer term coherence, you'd have to be able to give it a terminal goal, like run this, this e-commerce store or something like that. It would need to be able to dissolve that down into individual tasks, which it can kind of do already. And then it would have to be able to dynamically reorient on the fly, maybe come up with fresh sub goals, scrap the entire plan and start over from scratch. Like to, to me, that's an agent that that's something that could show up to a programming job and compete with the humans is, is if it could do something yeah. like that. It feels like that's something we're still a little ways away from. I don't doubt that you could prompt it in a way that gets agent agenty kind of behavior out of it, or at least output out of it. And if it sure. can engage in rudimentary tool use, like it can call an API, well, then you can give it yeah. more functionality out of that. But from what I understand, the currently existing systems kind of tend to get stuck in loops, so they ground out relatively quickly yeah. and just stop being productive. And I, I guess I'm just not super convinced that GPT six is going to be big enough to get like a coherent goal seeking agent uh any, anything like a human being not to say that it's impossible altogether but <clears throat> it feels it feels like we're a ways away from that yeah if you think yeah. in term in terms of uh getting into a wrestling match with with ai um this this is something that doesn't have any muscles doesn't have any any body any any flesh that you you don't know where to press on the muscle here to to, to make this hurt, uh, you can't feel the aches and pains. You can't feel all of these physical things that we as humans know about. All of that is part of our intelligence, and that's very difficult to have that conveyed through artificial intelligence. Yeah, I think the the, the progress towards like robotics types things probably will be slower than. Um, but on just like doing the things. I forget, like some ridiculous fraction of jobs are just like keyboard only of like you you get on a laptop. And so I, I, I forget, I, I, just, I, I vaguely remember something like 40%, but it's like some ridiculously high number. Anyways, on, on that point, of, um, so I think you're right. If it was just like the current approach where 99% of the compute for any given training run is just coming from the pre-training where you're doing next to prediction, I think uh, agentic behavior would... Uh, would be like significantly dampened and would be unreliable, like you mentioned. I think, uh, but what we should expect is that the assist, the, as we do more RL on these systems, it seems like the path forward is that a greater and greater share of the compute we use for training comes from doing RL. And the reason it would increase, by the way, is that um, now that they're smart enough to at least like try being agentic some of the times, that's actually a loss function you can use feasibly. Because before, it's just like, it's totally stupid. It's not even going to like, get the pull request one out of a million times. So you can get the pull request one out of a hundred times. You can reinforce that, um, make it a better and better agent. So as long as it's like somewhat of a, a sometimes be, uh, act as an agent, I think from there, the RRL setup might work such that it becomes a better and better agent over time. And more of the compute goes towards that kind of um, reinforcing that kind of agentic behavior. That's interesting. How do you, how do you define agent? I don't have a good definition off the top of my hand. I, uh, my sort of like in, uh, the the intuitive way I'd like think about it is something like a, a thing that like w wants a goal and is able to stay oriented towards that goal over uh, a significant period of time. And so, if we're building like an artificial agent, it's something like generate pull requests, or would it be something higher level like clean up this code base? Yeah, all right. I think that that would also make sense. I mean, the RL. I think one of the weaknesses of it is that it has to 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 be able to like train feasibly. It has to be things you can evaluate uh, on the fly. So thing is relevant to code. Like, if there's some way to measure, how, have you cleaned up this code base? Well, um, I, yeah, that that would. Um, I'm trying to think. What are other good RL? Another thing is just that, like the uh, the dumb models that evaluate each other on how, uh, in an agentic sense, like how well they completed a task. Um, and if, if they're not like, you know, we have evidence of this with GAN models, with the generator and discriminator, that like even though the models are dumb, they can at least critique themselves in well enough that they can 
uh, bootstrap their way to greater uh, intelligence. And you can imagine a similar thing with uh, being able to complete tasks that require agency. Okay. And then are, are there any benchmarks you'd look for to say this is crossing a line and something kind of dangerous, like it's an agent and it's the kind of thing that might be pursuing goals we wouldn't want it to have. It's not just clever prompting anymore. It's uh, there's a deeper, deeper kind of processing happening. Like what would you look for? Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, to be clear, by the way, I'm, uh, I'm still trying to make up my mind on, even if it's agentic in the sense of it can like do certain tasks, how much like uh, misalignment risk comes along with different kinds of agency. Like in the limit, you can imagine something that is like, it can do all the tasks a human can do that it's by definition as agentic as a human is and can then have a broad range of goals. But before that, I'm like, I'm, I'm like not sure if it can like, you know, do a job over a course of a day that's like going to be capable of crazy things or want to do crazy things. But on the benchmarks question, I, I think, yeah, I think one of the problems is that like, we actually don't have good benchmarks right now. A lot of the benchmarks are MMLU or human eval or whatever. They're like 90% the models are already getting. So by the next models, if we're going to be like totally saturated uh, and going to be kind of useless, um, I don't think we have a good like general reasoning. Uh, I mean, the, the, the one is uh, a sweet bench is what uh, um, a benchmark that was released a couple of months ago that measures their ability to complete these four requests. Then GB4 got like 1%. And you can imagine a more, uh, a, a, a model that has longer, can function over longer time horizons being able to do better. Or that took them to sort of like auto GPT setup where it can like debug the code after trying to run it and it doesn't work and, you know, that kind of thing. That's very interesting. Uh, so, so which which of the AI systems um, uh, are would you rank at at uh, the top, and which ones are close behind it as far as being accurate and um, producing the best results? Yeah, um, I haven't kept that up to date on all the models. It, it, I mean, it seems to be like all the publicly available ones, as far as I know, GPT four is uh, Turbo is like the best, but. It seems like Gemini Ultra is probably going to be better, uh, slightly better once it comes out. Um, as for, yeah, I, I don't know which are the necessarily uh, the worst ones, but it, it does seem to be that like, yeah, Gemini Ultra and GBD4 have kind of got the ball game. Here. Have, have you tried Grok at all? No, I, I haven't. <laughs> have you? <laughs> I have. I, yeah. What do you think? Uh, I it got pretty good results. Pretty good results. Uh, what did you uh, use it for? Oh, I was just testing it out. Uh, I can't even remember what I used it for, but it. Um, I've, I've been running comparisons between um, uh, Anthropic and uh, Claude 2 and um, Bard and GPT-4. Um, and there's a, a few other ones out there too, Monica. And uh, so, I don't know, I keep going back to chat GPT-4. That yeah. always always produces solid results. Yeah, yeah. Are are you at all sympathetic to some of the arguments made by cognitive scientists? And I'm thinking specifically of Gary Marcus that the architectures in these large language models are just not the kind of thing that can be in AGI. Like we call them neurons, but they're not neurons, right? It's sort of if you squint and you're standing far away, it kind of looks like one, but. The, the way humans operate, like the only example of a general intelligence we have is one, not very well understood, and two, seems to have a great deal of richness to it. Like once every other decade or so, a new subdomain in psychology opens up centered around narrative thinking, and it just turns out that no one had ever looked at it before, but it plays this really incredibly important role in how humans plan or think or imagine or conceive of goals and move towards them. I, I like... I, I guess I, I'm not unsympathetic to the idea that, you know, a, a radically different architecture could yield a general intelligence. We just don't know. We don't have very much experience trying to make agents or intelligent systems. But uh, I, I know that there there are a variety of people with a, a lot of knowledge in the domain who don't think that deep learning as an approach will get us there. And I just didn't know if yeah. you dove into any of that or had any thoughts on it. Uh, I've looked at Gary Marcus's stuff specifically, but I have looked into Steven Pinker's, uh, whom I greatly respect. And um, so you you read a stuff from the '90s, like he's he's been a uh, deep learning skeptic, or but what it was known back in the day in the '90s, or it was like connectionism. And he's been a skeptic of that for a long time. If you read How the Mind Works or his book on linguistics, um, or the language instinct, he, he's like, 
But if you like actually read the specific things he uh, says, like, oh, you know, these connectionist approaches, these deep learning approaches can't do this, this or that. It's like they can't do a sort of recursive reasoning or they, it's just like very basic things that if you type in inside GPT, it will be able to do. And so these people can make the claim that there's some fundamental barrier between the current systems and AGI, but have they been able to, they, they've repeatedly made claims about uh, previous barriers that have been uh, totally broken through and none of them have free registered a critique that if they had a good theory, you'd think they'd be able to say in advance, oh, the, you know, in fact, even without the current approaches, you probably can do the following things. But after those following things, they will never generalize to human level intelligence. But that's never the case, right? It's always like, it will not be able to do any of these things. And like, it does a lot of them and it keeps doing more and more of them. And bring the fascia, I don't know why you'd expect the current models to be the place where you'd, there would be like some sort of plateau or you need human, human type brains to get beyond that point. It just seems like a, uh, if they were like 20 years in the past, maybe it's a plausible thing. But like I, now it just seems like we've made so much progress already. We've like knocked down so many of the blocks. Um, and it seems similar to like the, the classic thing of uh, an airplane is not designed the same way as uh, a bird, but it can still fly. Um, it doesn't need to be exactly the same. And it's just like the basic thing of, uh, um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I'll let you respond. I've said a lot, so I'll let you respond. No, no, no. I, I think all that's very compelling. Uh, Marcus at least claims to have made predictions like that. Uh, so it might be worth looking in, into to his work and having him on. If like he uh, he did an interview with alongside Elias Yudkowsky on somebody's podcast, and he specifically referenced neurosymbolic uh, reasoning or neurosymbolic approaches as being a promising domain to get into if you're wanting to build more general and robust systems. So uh, that's just a, a lead for you to track down if you have the time for it. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've like paid attention to even some other cognitive scientists like Terence Deacon. We wrote this really interesting book called The Symbolic Species in the 90s. Um, and in fact, it was like, it's compelling enough that even like DeepMind released a paper saying like try to compare their models to like the symbolic species uh, things. Of, basically, can uh, humans can learn uh, the symbolic representations of things that what allows us to be general and, um, um, you know, the model, model the world in this abstract way. Uh, you know, like obviously models, uh, LLMs can do this to, uh, already and to a greater and greater extent as they scale, it seems like. Like they can clearly think about symbols. Uh, that's what they're good at, right? They're good at language. So there's well, a few other outputting it. They're good at outputting it. But is that the same thing as thinking about it? Like there's this whole controversy about whether or not ChatGPT has a world model. And I haven't spent a lot of time getting into that. But it, it seems like being able to predict the text is not the same thing as understanding the referent of the symbol in the world which is something you get as an infant by crawling around and just having your parents point at things and say door, banana, dog, like th that's kind of how you get it. And you understand that there's a world out there that uh, these symbols refer to things and you're operating with those as inputs to a general mechanism that you have through natural selection. Like to say that, okay, well, the, the language models can output long strings of tokens. Like I don't think that's any more compelling uh, as evidence for there being an underlying general process than it would be if, if I learned how to like write some ancient language, the, the Chinese room thing, you, you see where I'm going with this. Yeah, I, I think there's like two, two basic arguments. One is the higher level of they are clearly able to do things which they would not be able to do if they did not have a world model. Like just, just think of any given task, uh, uh, like ha having it do the task, like how was it able to do that if it didn't understand the requirements of the task? I guess I'm speaking in a more generic terms, I guess uh, I can't, the, the yeah, there's like a bunch of different examples you can go through. But the second piece of uh, evidence I'll offer is that they actually trained a model to play this chess-like a transformer. It wasn't a different kind of model. They changed transformer to play a chess-like game called Othello. And mm. it isn't very much like chess, but it can just be uh, understood by models. So uh, what they were able to do after is just by reading the insides, of, not the outputs, but just by like looking at the activations as they place this game, they were able to... Um, then train a classifier that can look at that and predict the state of the board. So, which which is like just would not be possible if the model did not have an internal representation of what the board looked like. And it kind of makes sense, right? To actually play the game well, it was trained to play the game well. You actually have to have an understanding of like what the game is like, like have a model of the game, right? And I think this is basically the story in other domains where models are able to uh, accomplish tasks and do things. Absolutely. Are you enjoying this episode of the Futurati podcast? If so, please like it, give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and share it with your friends. 
by far, the best way to help us grow is to spread the word on social media, which will expose our content to more people and help us continue to bring you interviews with world-leading experts in AI, quantum computing, cryptocurrencies, and so much more. Thank you in advance. Well, scaling that up, though, having having AI understand what the role of a human is in in the world, um, uh, this this whole idea of what our purpose is moving forward, um, mm -hmm. these are kind of esoteric concepts that I, th I think those are the things that define consciousness, not um, not, not the that the basic things that are uh, easy to grasp. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think you just described the alignment problem. You know what I mean? Like that they, they will be able to do all these tasks, but then they won't get necessarily have our human understanding of these, these more, uh, value-based questions. So do you, do you have a solution to the alignment problem that you want to bust out right now? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I am also skeptical of the, like the default framing on doomers with the alignment problem of we need to make these things have exactly our values and just this very narrow way of thinking about uh values as in like you have this utility fund that might be that well, i just think like i'm like very unsure about what uh like values are like is it just a utility function it might be i'm just like not sure um and i am worried about if we if like alignment succeeds in the extent of like we just make slave gods um and you know for the rest of time we just have these uh on where they could have been like internally self-reflective and um uh you, uh you had their own wishes and desires to do cool things with the galaxies but instead they uh they're totally submissive i, I would be concerned about that kind of future if that's if, if that's what alignment means i'm like definitely not uh that's not like necessarily the future i want interesting so what's the future you would want i think basically something like milky way or at least a, a significant fraction of the milky way and um especially earth and the solar system are just kind of like left for the normies aka humans and then like as you go further and further from uh from earth like things get more and more weird at some point there's like augmented human minds and then you go to other galaxies and all kinds of crazy shit is happening um you know so it's like the the Vin Werner Vinci zones of thought are you are you familiar with the zones of thought from the deepness in the sky and a fire upon the deep those early novels I, I should really read it but uh, uh, that yeah it's something you're interesting oh that's fascinating um so well, that, that's interesting. So let's, let's talk a little bit about values. What, what's your skepticism around the Doomer understanding of values and how you would impute them into a, an advanced AI system? Um, Joe Carl Smith has a great series on this on his blog. He's a philosopher. Uh, and um, th like the, the strong version of the, the, the Doomer thing is that even if our values are even if our values are slightly different than the AIs, if they're extrapolated out to uh, something that is all powerful. It's th that like slight difference means that everything we care about will be evaporated. Like if it cares about everything we care about, but doesn't um, doesn't value that uh, that doing repetitive things is bad, then it just means that it's gonna like make some repetitive uh, simulation that's like not valuable from our perspective. Um, and I. Well, first of all, like it proves too much in the sense that like different humans probably have slightly different values that if you extrapolate out, probably what does that mean if like and even the limit that we probably have uh, um, utility functions that would never be able to coordinate. And um, uh, I'm just saying, I feel like how, how well do we know this stuff? Or just the utility functions and just our current, the, the, the Dutch book theorems, whatever. They're like less than a hundred years old that we're talking about things that are going to be much more intelligent than us. We're uh, just like, we're in a period of rapid knowledge gain without the AIs even. So I'm just like pretty agnostic about what that looks like. I'm just not sure that it necessarily looks like uh, I've found my utility function and I'm just going to like turn the universe into the thing that most resembles it. So you're skeptical that that will be the procedure followed by an advanced super intelligence. Yeah. Okay, so so then that sounds like you don't buy a major branch in the the Yudkowsky and tree then the the whole fragility and complexity value thesis. Uh, yeah. uh, well, or maybe possibly, possibly even the orthogonality, possibly even the orthogonality, yeah. depending on how you interpret it. Yeah, I think those are plausible to be clear, and like I think we sh they are concerning enough that like we should do the alignment things and like take this really seriously, not just you know 
you know, go crazy with it, like go carefully. But, um, and I think we'll also learn a lot as these systems get smarter and we'll just get to evaluate like what's actually happening. But uh, I'm not like convinced. I see. So what do you think are the more promising approaches to alignment then given this heterodox opinion and the fact that you've spoken to a lot of people in the field? Yeah, I will say like uh, Yudkowsky himself versus the alignment field is uh, sufficiently different. Like Yudkowsky is, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Like he's he's he, he's like so worried that he thinks basically everybody thing everybody's doing in the alignment field is doomed uh, and pointless. And I think a lot of things these people are doing are actually not doomed and uh, not pointless. They are interesting. Um, Everything from like, I'm sure we've heard these things like mechanics and trivial trying to understand what's going on in the models to scalable supervision. I'm, yeah, I'm like, honestly, not sure, uh, what, uh, what, like if somebody wants to work on this problem, what, what, what is the best way forward? Um, um, so it, it occurred to me that the, the Turing test is something that was relatively easy for people to comprehend and understand. Yeah. Do we have an equivalent? test for AGI? Do we have a AGI test that's like a Turing test? Do we have an alignment test uh, that's like mm -hmm. the Turing test? Uh, it would seem like those are things that are kind of uh, something that we need to uh, have a reference in the background. Yeah. I, I think uh, the, the goal of mechanistic interoperability is that it gets to this that at some point it's like uh, advanced enough and scalable enough that you can have a human level model and you just like read its weights and somehow understand whether it's like being deceptive um, or, or or something. Uh, and then I, it, 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 and Paul Cristiano has this uh, uh, galaxy brain and Neil Matt for if he's working on or this, this scheme of... Uh, I don't, I don't even know if I'm going to explain the idea where it's basically that things are doing things for the default reason and then we will have a sort of machine that can figure out whether it's doing it for a reason we're not expecting, which is a deceptive reason. Anyways, I don't know. The, the basic idea is that we'll be able to read the rates and see if they're lying to us. <laughs> well, let's hope so. I mean, we can't even do that with people, though. Well, actually, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we can. But, like, you can detect yeah. deception at least a little bit, but you can't actually read the neural weights, I don't think, out of the brain and say that's deception. It's just sometimes right. there's a part of the brain that kind of lights up associated with deception, but that yeah. doesn't seem properly mechanistic exactly. Yeah, although the the difficulty of the brain is that we can't, with with the weights of a neural network, you can like literally see all the numbers down to the infinitesimal decimal, decimal point. With the brain, we can't do that, so it's just a much harder problem. Um, and they're just like very nicely organized, just a bunch of matrices, right? It's not a bunch of random connections. Uh, so <laughs> totally inscrutable structure in there. Uh, has anyone surprised <laughs> you in all in all these uh, interviews you've done with leading AI luminaries? Uh, has anyone sort of shocked you with something or surprised you by being more? optimistic than you expected or less optimistic than you expected? I was kind of surprised. Like, Darius seems to have really short timelines. Um, he's like two to three years until it's like most more or less indistinguishable from a human on uh, many like medium horizon tasks. Um, I, I, even like Shane Lake, his, his timelines are 2028, 20, which is five years from now, or I guess now four years. So... It, it, yeah, I was surprised at the, the extent to which the people who are running the labs have pretty short timelines. Yeah, that's crazy. There, there's such a disconnect. Like the, the people who are running these labs think we're like five years away from arguably the most transformational event in the history of Probably. our species. You know, it's just like I would expect more fires and freaking out and stuff. Like, you know, people people threw a bigger fit over Y2K, you know, and, and this could plausibly be an extinction level event. I, I don't know. Like, that doesn't mean they're wrong, but it's just like, it's a very surreal time. You know, you've got Yudkowsky's like bomb the data centers, shut it down. And other people like I, I go on podcasts sometimes and they're like, these things are not even the beginnings of approximations of intelligence. Uh, and it's, there's such a gap. You know, we're so confused yeah. about like the core concepts. It's just really kind of terrifying and exciting too. I guess there's a lot of work to be done, but I don't know. I'm not sure what, what to make of it. Although I think if you look back through history at most, even when we were very close to cataclysmic things or uh, optimistic things, that just people had very mixed opinions until a very shortly before the whole thing was finalized, right? Like uh, up until uh, Hitler invade, was it uh, 
uh, if Poland finally were uh, the, the gov- all the governments are like, well, but until then he's like you know, invading Czechoslovakia and you know the, we're like all right, whatever. It's just like he's he's trying to reconstruct the German lands or something. Um, and I think even when the Manhattan Project was basically almost even after the Trinity test, many uh, many people, experts even, were saying in public who weren't involved in the Manhattan Project, though it's like not possible to do this. You can't like get enough uranium refined to um, uh, cha- set up a chain reaction. So I think it's like not that uncommon in history of like b- being totally surprised at how like how fast history is coming at you. We probably should try to be less surprised uh, by this sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> so if if you were given a billion dollar immersion ventures grant to study AI safety, how would you spend your time? Like what what questions would you try to answer to get purchase on? Uh, like resolving the core confusions. That's a really good question. Only good questions around here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Besides um, buying a swimming pool, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll drown them in, in inscrutable matrices. Um, I would. I don't know if I like necessarily dump my money into any existing approach because it does seem like they're pretty well funded. Um, um, that, that might be wrong, but I, I don't know. They're, they're like, uh, uh, yeah, maybe I try to just, I try to, uh, this is a totally generic, big answer, but see, see what we're missing basically. And also work on the, and what else part of the question. It's like, okay, even if you get, yeah, here's one thing I think the alignment frame, like really doesn't emphasize enough of, even if like alignment works in the sense that these models do what we expect them to do and do what we tell them to do. All right, nuclear weapons do what you want them to do. If you like, oh, the nuclear weapon, it'll like do what you want it to do. Doesn't mean a nuclear weapon is safe, right? So just thinking through, this is you know we're gonna like expand out through the galaxies. Uh, we're gotta think about the rights of these digital people. We gotta think about all kinds of uh, things about how how we govern uh, space. How are we gonna? Um, I, I would just like think about the and what else part of the question. Okay, maybe another way of asking it is like, what are you most confused about with respect to AI safety? Because for me, it's like some of the some of the basic concepts like intelligence, volition, consciousness, and like the property of being alive. I notice people move between the four very fluidly. They'll switch from talking about intelligence to talking about consciousness to talking about agency. Like they're distinct. And so I, I think like where I would start, it wouldn't require a billion dollars, but it's just like a year or two thinking about like what, what do these terms actually mean? How do you induce fresh definitions of them and use that to think about oh. whether these systems are intelligent? It's like, we sort of throw that out there. We talk like, oh, of course, GPT-4 is intelligent, or of course it's not. It's like, but a lot of that depends on your theory of cognition, like what you mean by that term. And that really? in turn depends on deeper epistemological considerations, like the framework you're operating in. So it seems like only really? there's just like root level problems here. And it's just causing people to talk past each other, to not take it seriously or to freak out over it. Canada, yeah, totally. I mean, like, yeah, I, I, that's that's where the thirty percent on the scaling comes from. That the basic way, that the sort of analogy that people like to use for these, um, they, they talk about intelligence as compression, and specifically in terms of the Solomonoff induction analogy, where mm-hmm. it's basically the program that can most efficiently make sense of bits of information from the environment. And I'm not convinced that I'm not sure like that's what intelligence necessarily is. I, I think it's like totally leaves a lot out to be explained. It, there's like well, specific problems with the compression analogy that I talk about in my post. So yeah, I, I totally think that's like something. Uh, I don't know if like just thinking about it will do a lot of good though, because I don't know. I feel like a lot of information theorists have like tried just thinking about it. I think we'll learn a lot as these models if they get smarter, or how they get smarter, and it was a domain specific way. So that'll teach us a lot about the nature of intelligence. That maybe it's just a bunch of domain specific heuristics. If it's if it's very general. That'll also teach us a lot about intelligence. Um, then we can maybe see the circuit at, that's like leading to this general reasoning ability. So, um, yeah, I, I think we're going to learn about a lot about these mysteries as if these models continue to get better and we, we like try to figure out what's going on. Fantastic. Do you use uh, ChatGPT for anything? Are you, um, either, like, is it, have, has this been integrated into your workflow of your life? I, I use perplexity a lot um, and a ChatGPT too, but like, Perplexity has kind of replaced my default chat GPT use. Because you know what I usually use chat GPT for is a searching for information. And uh, perplexity, by the way, is like just a search engine kind of thing not, uh, that uses ChatGPT. So yeah, that, that's been sort of my default. But I've used it a lot. Yeah. Well, fascinating. Um, 
What are some broad themes that have emerged from the conversations you've had with all these different people? So you, you've talked to philosophers and historians and uh, demographers, and you cast a really wide net as we try to do as well. Uh, are there are there major ideas or common connections that you've seen across all those those conversations? Do you need a dynamic and knowledgeable speaker for an event? Thomas Fry and me, Trent Fowler, are both seasoned keynote speakers, able to converse on a wide array of topics to audiences of all sizes and skill levels. Go to the contact page at futuratipodcast.com to book Thomas or myself today and let us apply our years of experience in public speaking to make your event a smashing success. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't think so, or like nothing comes in my head as necessarily an obvious connection between them. Um, um, I, 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 I like make something up. I like, yeah, I, 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 like uh, you could hallucinate. You, you yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Could increase my temperature. Maybe I'll like come up with something. <laughs> yeah, GPT four would have would have nailed that. I think. Um, <laughs> no, that's interesting. Um, so, so what's what's coming down the line for the the Dorcas show? Yeah, I, I, I'm both broadcast. I want to do more writing. I want to figure out, you know, as you can see, I'm like really, I'm, uh, I'm agnostic and trying to figure out what I think about a lot of these questions. So, um, especially around the, like the what else part of the AI stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I think like very few people have thought that much about it and it just seems like it's totally underthought. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, maybe more around that. And just like generally, I feel like if I'm gonna be, if I'm gonna do this public, uh, this podcast thing and the things associated with it, I should like know more things, especially in domains. I, there's a certain, um, there's like bio or physics. I just have like high school level or you know basic like freshman year level understanding of these basic fields. So just like actually doing episodes on that, like reading the books or doing like uh, the, reading the basic uh, at least like parts of the basic textbook and um, like getting up to speed on relevant areas. You got to understand all the domains of life, you know, or all the, like, the, the, the domains of knowledge. So uh, you're getting up to stuff. Robin Hanson once told me that I, if, if I wanted to do that, I should just read textbooks for like three or four years. Yeah. He's like, and, and yeah. you could do that if you picked good textbooks and got really into them and chased like citations down. In a couple of years, you'd have a pretty good handle on the structure of knowledge, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Where all of it's going. Well, that's fascinating. It's, it's really cool that you could spend your day doing that, just learning. Like, I, I just, I want to be a professional learner. That's, I, I just yeah. want my whole day to be like reading books and thinking about stuff. Yeah, no, I feel super lucky because th th that's what I get to spend my time doing. <laughs> All right. So I think one more question I wanted to ask you is how you keep the beard so magnificent. Like uh, I I'm a fellow beard haver, but I don't feel like mine projects the same power and confidence that yours does. So uh, do you have any, do you have any tips on that? You want to leave the future audio podcast audience with, uh, be born Indian. <laughs> I don't guess there's much I can do about that at this point, but <laughs> nevertheless, that's, uh, that, that's, that's great advice. Well, we, we appreciate your time. Dorkish. Tom, did you have any, uh, last questions you want to ask? No, I think this has been uh terrific, um, the kind of the deep dive into AI here and, um, yeah, I really appreciate the way you think about these things. That's it's great. Yeah, we'll we will be watching future episodes with interest. Um, uh, yeah, and yeah, I, I really appreciate you guys letting me on. I mean, this is a this is a really interesting conversation, and um, uh, yeah, I, I feel like yeah, guys, that's great questions, and it was really it was great to like uh, try to think through these things live. Um, and uh, um, yeah, but uh, we respond to different things, so this is fun. Of course, of course. If if you want to, you know, talk to us again, or if you have any, you know, just want to pick our brains about something, you're you're welcome to reach out. But uh, we we appreciate it, and uh, we wish you the best of luck in future endeavors. Great, you as well. Thanks.